And so the reason why I wanted to sort of have you speak to us a little bit is because I think it's important to be able for us to learn to actually distinguish between aesthetics and creativity because at at its fundamentals creativity is a way of thinking and you know when when you've kind of when you kind of took us through your journey um of moving like sort of making the decision to take a leap of faith um when you were in Malawi and deciding to actually make Africa your home you know we've spoken to a number of creative people and one of the things that has been consistent and Steph mentioned this is like this sort of almost just ignoring risk in a sense and reaching for the opportunity we've had so many people speak about that and then the other thing that has also been a common thread is this feeling of like inadequacy and you know you spoke a little bit about your time at founders factory and the huge shift that you made and having to actually deal uh, deal with the feelings of sometimes feeling like you're out of your depth and that's also a common thread that we've kind of seen speaking to quite many of our guests if not all Hello and welcome back to the Edit and Do podcast. Very excited for our chat today. I feel like I say that every week, but I am excited every single week for our chat. Today is a little bit of a different one, you know. Up until now we've spoken to, you know, photographers, we've spoken to art, fine artists, we've spoken to designers. Today we have somebody who is at the head of a ship. Um I'm quite keen to chat. Um today we're speaking to Charles Friedman. Someone who I got to know pretty recently and whose story kind of gripped me pretty much from the from the get go. I'm I'm not going to give away too much. I will I'll say that right now he's sort of running the show at a startup called Servcraft, which is one that's pretty interesting and hopefully we can chat a little bit here and there about it, but we'll kind of see how the conversation goes. But I think more importantly and one of the things that I'm excited to chat to is um you know Charles you kind of said when we initially spoke that you your journey kind of started um started in in Europe and I'll give you the sort of space to give all of the details but then you actually made the decision to come over to Africa and this has since kind of become your home and I think it's going to be interesting to hear how that actually happened and your and your take on it but before we get into all of that Charles welcome welcome to the show it's great to have you thanks thanks Alfie it's a, it's a real privilege to be here I think um uh it's it's quite intimidating following um following the path of the, the previous guests you've had uh, on the show um I'm hopeful that perhaps my creative uh, journey to get to where I am uh, might offer some uh, some um uh, provoking and inspiration to anyone who's uh, either in the creative space or or not in the creative space I think we all have an opportunity in um in our lives to make creative choices um it doesn't mean we have to be steeped mm-hmm. in design in the creative industries it's just a function of um opening our minds to doing different things and thinking in different ways to those that we've previously done so yeah real privilege to be here Alfie thanks thank you thank you um yeah i think it's going to be great and i think that's a very good point you know because uh it's very easy to sort of think that the creative people are only the people who kind of have all of these like the output is this beautiful image or this thing that sounds amazing but you know there are other ways to think about creativity and it manifests differently in 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 every in, in each person and you know we'll get into that but maybe before we do Charles do you mind just telling us a little bit about you know the origin story and how you kind of um ended up where you are today no problem um it's certainly not quite uh you know the marvel Marvel origin story and it's a uh, drama but um <laughs> it it hasn't been uh hasn't been a linear path um and I think a lot of that steeped in in you mentioned you know 
uh, you mentioned the element of creativity. A lot of that's steeped in just asking the question, like, why so often um, over the course of my career? And mm. it started in London, which is where, I've, uh, where I was born and raised. And you know, I followed a pretty linear path. You know, I ticked the boxes of my parents, um, wildest dreams of going to a good school and getting a good job in a, in a bank in, in London. And there was a point where, you know, a couple of years in, sitting on the 20-something floor of a skyscraper wearing a suit, looking down at the people, um, you know, shuttling from the tube to their offices and thinking like, they all look like ants. And then kind of having a reflection of like, oh shit, I'm an ant, you know? And, um, <laughs> you know, th there was a moment where it's like, the idea of success um, is not the same as your own journey towards personal fulfillment. And I think, you know, at 27, mm -hmm. At that point in my life, I, I you know, didn't know didn't know anything actually, and was fortunate enough to have gotten to a place that gave me options. Um, but equally, mm -hmm. you know, those those also didn't seem appealing at the time. So uh, I left. Mm -hmm. uh, I made a decision kind of not long after having that realization and that reflection that I, I couldn't stay doing what I was doing and made the decision to leave. Um, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. but I knew I wanted it to be steeped in um, exposure to rich and diverse places and people and experiences, the likes of which I'd you know, only typically found traveling. I was a real, you know, real, real keen traveler and spent a lot of time traveling alone across different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I reached out to find uh, organizations that you know, helped place people in in interesting places and found a mm -hmm. company that, that placed people um, in developing markets associated to the work they were doing previously. And I remember vividly sitting in a train station um, with, a, with a guy, Ewan, his name was, um, and he said, do you want to go to Malawi? And, and I said, yes, absolutely. And then I said, where's Malawi? Um, and that was kind of it, uh, Alfie. That was, that was very much the start of a journey from which you know, I'd never look back. I, I spent... Mm. I spent a year in Malawi having an amazing experience um, running a couple of programs, one lending money to young people to start businesses and, and the other, um, we started a small business consultancy to provide services to the small business community in southern Malawi. And mm -hmm. the exposure to Malawians was wonderful, the business community was wonderful, and that whole world of other expats who were living really interesting lives and and doing interesting things from development to investment to financial services it was just great. And, and I don't know if this is the most important thing, but one of the most useful parts of the experience was I didn't experience winter. And there was this moment <laughs> in my life where I'm like, oh, wow, I can live somewhere where there's, there's no winter. And uh, it, might sound, it might sound like not that important, but it, uh, it actually was a formative moment because it helped me subsequently make decisions around what I wanted my life to look like, not around career, but actually around life. Mm. Um, Amazing. And, you know, the subsequent decisions that I made and even the ones I make today are steeped in what I want my life to look like as opposed to what I want my career to look like um, because the mm -hmm. career is always needs to enable that, that life. Um, yeah. So from Malawi... I don't know if I'm talking too much or you want me to, you want me to <laughs> no, go ask ahead. any questions. Keep going. From Malawi, um, you know, there was a moment where I, about three months in, I had to make a decision whether or not to stick around because they'd offered me, offered me a job to stay for the whole year or go back home. And there was a moment where you know, I, was, I remember vividly um, pacing up and down the beach at Lake Malawi, reflecting <laughs> on do I want to stay in this beautiful place or do I want to go back and essentially live with my mum and, and work out a life in cold, wet London? And the answer was really <laughs> clear to me and it, it never, it, it, I never looked back. Um, mm. I met some amazing people and at the end of the experience, it helped me make a decision to move forward um, rather than move backwards. And after Malawi, I... I spent some time thinking about where I wanted to go and decided on South Africa and, and you know, being younger, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm too old at the moment, but being younger, 
there's a there's a, a strength and power in naivety and a strength and power mm. in you Absolutely. Know, misplaced <laughs> confidence um and mm -hmm. i i turned up in south africa in 2010 i i didn't have any job i didn't have any visa i didn't i had one friend um and i didn't really have a clue what i was doing but i really knew that i wanted to build a life here um because i wanted like a lifestyle that was outdoors and sunshine fueled and full of the beauty that South Africa offers um, and made a plan. Uh, and that was a, one of the first phrases I picked up in South Africa and the one that I certainly feel most affiliated to. Um, this idea uh -huh. that, no, that's all right, we'll make a plan. Um, so fortunate enough to mm -hmm. meet some great people, um, spend five, nearly five years working with PwC, traveling across the continent, helping solve big meaningful problems for big companies um, mm -hmm. and subsequently you know learn on that journey that um, as great as it was and as, as you know, fun as it was solving the diversity of problems for other people they were solving problems for other people you know mm. being a consultant you, you don't own anything um, you mm -hmm. own the targets that you're set and you own the quality of the output but you're never in charge of moving the needle um, you're in charge mm -hmm. of helping and advising other people to move the needle. And that's, I didn't find that fulfilling. Um, and that helped me make the decision to move into ABSA. Um, so we've all got, uh, we've all got some ABSA on us. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot of things to be said about ABSA, but for the, for the nearly, for the near five years that I was there, I was privileged enough to um, spend a lot of that time working on the separation from Barclays, but at a level mm -hmm. that was an incredible experience. You know, one was at a group level, helping to really navigate the whole bank towards you know, getting regulatory approval for the mm -hmm. separation, which doesn't sound that sexy to maybe a, a designer. <laughs> um, but at the time, it was incredible work. It was like high pressure, high mm -hmm. intensity, very smart people. And then spent another like three years working with the head of separation for the rest of Africa, um, uh, as well as executives across the continent, really building the capability and setting the foundation on which you know, the biggest transformation program on the continent was being run and sure. just amazing experience with amazing people. Um, mm -hmm. And all of that was enriching. And I saw that at the end of it, um, there was going to be a moment where it wasn't clear what the future held. And um, there's a big yeah. difference of, you know, changing things and running things. I, I really believe, like, I find so much more joy in the changing things and the intensity of, of the chaos of change, the uncertainty of change, mm -hmm. the, the dynamics associated to that. I don't think I could really be in a place where I was doing a business as usual job, like an operational job that was just the same, similar things every day. Mm -hmm. And I also reflected on the fact that, you know, more and more I was becoming aware that the pace of change outside big organizations is so much faster than in big organizations. And mm. yeah. it just wasn't satisfying for me to not be learning fast enough um, and mm -hmm. to reflect on to reflect on being in a world in which I wasn't, you know, I was disadvantaged as a function of not having the exposure to the things that were happening outside as opposed to inside. And so um, I, I wanted to try and make a shift in career to be, instead of in a big incumbent, like uh, framing it as like, uh, instead of optimizing the present, I want to, want to be building the future. Um, yeah. And that sounds nice, but you don't type that into Google and find the answer of what you're looking for in terms of a, a next step in a career. <laughs> so it involved a, a lot of cups of coffee with a lot of different people. Um, coffee is very underrated as a, as a career tool. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I uh, was fortunate enough to come across some incredible people um, who just started an investment um, company called Founders Factory Africa. Um, and at the time that I met them, they were about nine months into their journey. They weren't really a player in the space. There wasn't much of a brand associated to them. Um, and I met some great people. 
the founding team there were and still are, you know, exceptional bunch of people. And they, I was grateful that they saw in me not, not a, not a, you know, a corporate incumbent, um, which they were, they were, they would have, I wouldn't have blamed them for thinking that just based on my career, but they saw in me someone who you know, could play a role in the kind of impact they were looking to make across the continent. Um, so Founders Factory Africa, if you don't know, is a, is a venture development firm that invests and builds early stage technology businesses across Africa. And you know they're on their way to building uh, and investing in 88 businesses at the moment. Um, and I think they're about to do many more in the not too distant future. Um, mm -hmm. And I spent two years with them as their head of partnerships. And, you know, it was a humbling experience because I'd come from a place where there was status, you know, uh, as a director in a bank, you kind of had mm. a certain status. I'd been there long enough mm -hmm. and was steeped in how things worked long enough to be able to navigate my way around it really well across the continent. You know, I had the phone numbers of the right people. And then all of a sudden I'm in a room with a bunch of 20 somethings, some of whom are more senior than me. And like everyone's challenging everything uh, in terms of what they have to say mm -hmm. and, and what I had to say. And it was, it was a humbling experience. It was a humbling, humbling experience to be stretched in that way, but also to have my mind um, and perspective stretched around the value that everyone has to offer, um, which often gets beaten out of you in a hierarchical organization mm. um, mm -hmm. as a function of the hierarchy and the egos and the statuses within that hierarchy. But more than that, it was exposure to a whole industry that I hadn't had any experience in. So it was a wild amount of imposter syndrome um, and you know, capabilities and functions that I hadn't had much exposure to, you know, from mm -hmm. product to growth. Um, you know, all of these things were new to me. Uh, mm -hmm. That being said, um, I think I contributed uh, well. I learned so much, made some amazing friends as well as colleagues. And over that time, you know, there's a point where you're kind of, you, you move from having that imposter syndrome to a point where, okay, I can actually add value. It might not be the same value as everyone else, but like I can add my own flavor mm -hmm. of value. And then as I consumed and learned more and more from the businesses that we were serving and the people I was working with, um, there was another point about two years later when it was like, okay, well, I want to go. You know, I'd like to see what's possible. Um, I'd like to stretch myself in, in terms of the kind of impact that I see so many of these talented founders making. Um, and yeah, there was another like, moment where I started a journey to find out what my next step was. Um, and, and I would never be mm -hmm. so arrogant to, to think that I had the competence or the confidence to, to know I was going to be successful. But I don't think anyone ever has that 100% surety. Mm -hmm. um, all I knew is that yeah. I had an itch and I needed to scratch it. So you know, out came the coffees and off we went again to have another <laughs> hundred cups of coffee um, mm -hmm. with a whole bunch of people. And it was, um, it was an exploration, you know, I'm nearly 40 years old. So there's other factors coming into play around, I've got a couple of kids, got a wife, got responsibilities. How much risk do I want to take? Mm -hmm. All of these different things. Um, and these are all, you know, important questions to ask when you're thinking about what you want to do with your mm. career, yeah. what you want to do with your life. And, um, and when, you, when you're in a, I don't know if you guys are married or, or have kids, but it becomes a very, it becomes a team decision. It's not just uh, you making the decision mm. anymore. It's, it's a unit. Um, and you're thinking not just you know, mm -hmm. short term, you have to think a bit more medium term. So ended up speaking to lots of different companies all the way from you know, concept, pre-seed, stage startups, all the way through to series mm -hmm. A, B startups and I kind of knew after many interactions that you know, I wanted, I wanted the opportunity to lead a business, um, not necessarily in a CEO capacity, but you know, as part of the leadership team. 
and I wanted um, you know real skin in the game, you know, real material skin in the game. So that's kind of where I got to in my realization. But finding finding an opportunity like that was was challenging because uh, you know I don't know post Series A the management structure is often pretty fixed, and when you get to yeah. pre seed. There's, you know, there's opportunity, but there's associated risk, like really high risk. Mm. Yeah. So, so the sweet spot, um, I didn't know what was out there, and all I knew that it was a function of lots of coffees, um, and that, that, that I, I was hoping to come across it, and, and that's really where I came across <laughs> Surfcraft. Um, mm-hmm. I met this incredible uh, group of investors um, who introduced me to an amazing founding team. And very quickly, I was able to kind of identify, you know, the value I might be able to add to this business um, mm-hmm. on a number of levels. And maybe like your relationship, Alfie, with Stephanie, one thing led to another. And um, they asked me to join the team. And I, it's been a, it's been a, bit of a, it's been a bit of a, a love story ever since and, and, and I don't just mean the team I actually mean the problem we're solving mm. um, because mm-hmm. for many for many of either you or your listeners it's not always obvious um, when you when you think about electricians and plumbers and installers it's not always clear like that they even have a problem um, because you're not necessarily yeah. exposed <laughs> to it um, mm. mm-hmm. but um I don't know how much you want me to talk about this, but like the the thing that I feel more passionate about and more confident about every single day, and I'm not necessarily going to go into the details of Surfcraft if that's not what you want us to go into, but I feel mm-hmm. that I'm in a problem space where there are so many huge opportunities um, and we are so well placed to solve them. Um, so... Yeah, now I run a business. We've grown from six people to eleven people in the last four months. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm—I I'm, don't know if I'm preempting it. You can see the board behind me, but actually, <laughs> we had our best month—best uh, month of the company's existence this month. Um, amazing! We That's have, amazing. Have, yeah, we've been—we've been building yeah. uh, over the last few months, and in the new year, things started picking up and. Yeah, February 2022 is sure. one of the best months of the company's uh, company's life so far. So, you know, you caught me on a good day. It's going well. Yeah, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I want to go back to um, the start of your journey, but also just make a comment on, you know, we started the episode, speak, or Alfie introduced you as someone who's not necessarily um, – exercising a creative perfection, so to say. But from listening to your career path and your life journey um, from what you've shared, there's definitely one characteristic that uh, is consistent for me, at least, with what we see in creatives, which is the the seek for and the, um, the wanting for uncertainty. And that's mm-hmm. kind of the, the pre- predecessor for for all the opportunities we accept because essentially as a creative you have to be very comfortable with uncertainty because you don't know yet what the outcome is doesn't matter what creative profession you're in and you are there to solve Mm -hmm. a certain problem and within solving that problem comes your um, need to be comfortable in that space of uncertainty so that's kind of what I saw the thread through your journey now I want to ask someone that came from one of the most first world cities in the world that a city that is so saturated with opportunities um obviously at the moment i don't know how it was um when you were still living there uh when you were a bit younger but why what was what was the thing that made you want to move from a first world country with a lot of first world opportunities to go to a development country and throughout your thread of your career developing or uh, non-developed spaces if that makes sense yeah i think it's an interesting question and i, I want to kind of just pick up on the word opportunities because you know on the one hand you can look at 
develop markets and you can see opportunities in terms of the big, the big brands um, or the amount of money flowing as, as a function of you know, the investment scene. Um, but it depends how you frame mm. opportunities, right? So I think also what I came for and what I stayed for has changed over time. Um, I'll touch on both of those. So okay. I think I came... Mm. I think I came initially for the opportunity to accelerate my growth and learning through exposure to new places and people. It was less around mm. career. Um, and I think I, I had my eyes opened as to what that could be when I, when I spent my time in Malawi. Mm. Um, I think subsequently I, I moved to South Africa and um, I actually found it richer in opportunity um, and it was richer in opportunity as a function of a number of things and primarily and for better or worse um, I found that my experience from the UK was mm -hmm. um, you know, more highly valued for example in South Africa mm -hmm. like when I got here sure. and that afforded me greater opportunity as a function of that whereas in the UK you know there's not, not that there's a hundred of me or a thousand of me, but there are more of me um, in terms of mm. you know, the experience that I had. And so that, that was valued and that gave me opportunity that I don't think I would have gotten. Um, I might have done like if I stayed in the UK. And I think being able to marry that with the um, exposure to the rest of Africa that has really dominated most of my career put me in a place where it was just the best best lifestyle. You know, I was able to grow professionally whilst immersing myself across the continent um, in a way that was you know, a real dream, actually. Uh, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of how the opportunities changed over time, um, when I reflect on the opportunity now, what we're seeing is, you know, year on year investment especially VC early stage investment in Africa, like increasing exponentially. Mm -hmm. I think when you reflect on the opportunity across Africa based on the problems that need to be solved um, and the way in which they need to be solved in a different way to in developed markets, that's the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that the world is waking up to that as a function of the capital we see flowing into the continent and across the continent. Um, it's, you know, recognized in the amount of people looking to start businesses and ventures. You don't start a business um, and a startup for the sake of it. You start it to solve a problem. And I think that across the continent, there's no shortage of problems. Um, but that, Stephanie, is, is the exciting piece um, because it's how you choose to frame those problems. <laughs> And if you're able to marry, you know, an entrepreneurial continent with you know, essentially the, the dry powder of investment coming in, um, I think it's an incredible time to be part of this journey um, on the continent. So mm. yeah. that's certainly what's, uh, mm -hmm. what the opportunity looks like for me at the moment and for all of us if we choose to take it. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, so the two things that I want to highlight, the first is I'm definitely going to quote you on that co coffee piece. You know, you said um, <laughs> that uh, coffee is undervalued as a career tool. And I think that is very, very, very true. You know, you, <laughs> for most people, you're simply a conversation away from from your next opportunity. And, you know, sometimes you need to actually create that opportunity. And coffee is a very useful tool to create those conversations. Um, and, you know, in a sense, you can you can take it in, the, in a bit of a tongue in cheek way. But I think in on the other hand, in a very serious way, the amount that you can get done by just offering people an opportunity to engage and showing that you take them seriously as an individual and as a human, I think is something that's extremely important. Um, and I mean, you know, you the, the role that you sort of played at the Founders Factory as head of partnerships sort of shows your your understanding of that, because at the end of the day, all of us eat food and drink coffee. Well, not all of us drink coffee, but most of us do. Um, and sort of coming down at that level, it, it's, it's, it's just interesting how 
people from such different backgrounds come together, whether it's around the table to eat or to, to drink a cup of coffee, sort of equalizes the playing field in a strange way. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that, that um, a little bit because, because it's so important. Um, I think, and this, Alfie, I'm not sure how you experienced it, but, uh, you know, I found, I found kind of COVID challenging in that way because so many of the interactions became transactional in nature. And in the absence mm. of the water cooler talk and the coffees at work and all of those things, I, I, mm -hmm. I feel we were, we were kind of deprived of, of learning, right? Like, you know, you're exposed to people at work you might not otherwise hang out with in your day to day. Mm -hmm. But as a function of that, you learn from them because you get a glimpse into other worlds and other lives and other perspectives. And that mm. shifts your thinking. I, I, I think that COVID kind of definitely set us back from that. And I don't know how you're experiencing it, but I, I've kind of tried to swing back the other way and I'm trying to, you know, accelerate mm -hmm. the physical, the physical interactions um, just so I can, yeah. Of catch up on all the learning that was that was missed um mm -hmm. i don't know no i, I definitely agree with fun. you there. um but but you know one of the things i've realized is they're not as fun but they're better than nothing um so yeah, I know, at work i mean i i just started a new job at the beginning of the year um how's it going and it's it's going it's 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 <laughs> it's challenging um but it's good it's a good kind of challenging i remember when we when we chatted one of the pieces of feedback that you gave me that really stuck stuck with me is like, you know, um, and I'm definitely paraphrasing here, but you were speaking about like how, you know, if you want to, if you want to take yourself forward, you need to almost take more of the challenge, like more responsibility of more of the challenge in the day to day. And that, that for me was one of the things that kind of like made me start to really look at my, 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 my life at that time, my job, how much it was asking of me and whether I was happy with that. And that like, you know, one thing led to another and I sort of ended up where I am now. But kind of starting a new job in COVID is such a strange experience. And mm -hmm. Steph, I'm sure like you could you could uh, relate because you actually joined ABSA during COVID. And that's when we um, when we first met. But at the new company, I've had to like have so many virtual coffees and it's such a strange thing to invite a person to a coffee over text that you've never mm. spoken to or met before <laughs> um, but it had to become a part of my 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 daily like my daily life so in my calendar there's like a little little slot that's like book a co virtual coffee chat with a colleague and you know normally those things would happen a little bit more organically but i think you know since since everything that's happened We've kind of had to make some things that were natural a little bit more um, synthetic. And mm. although the synthetic is not as good as the natural, it's definitely better than nothing. I agree. I, I think, you know, even, even more after, I think it's a necessity to be effective um, because I think in all organizations, but especially so in big ones, um, the informal is as important as the formal. You know, I think mm -hmm. to, to effectively influence, it's not a function of design or the PowerPoint slide. It's a function of the relationship um, and building mm -hmm. that critical mass of relationships. Um, it's very hard to do virtually. Um, this yeah. is why you've got to be so deliberate about it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. So... So I, I did have a question and, and I di uh, diverged a little bit there. Um, okay. So it's the thing sure. that I wanted to ask you about, <laughs> um, I, I just say that because I think this is going to be a, a useful question and maybe you could bring some insights that, that most people might not actually have access to. Um, so I, I'd, I'd watch some of your the, the content that you sort of featured in on YouTube um, when you were at the Founders Factory. And one of the topics that kind of stuck with me a little bit is the relationships that can be developed between startups and corporates. Mm -hmm. And I found, I, found, I found it quite an interesting thing because in, you know, I've sort of played in the, in the corporate area a little bit and, you know, I've kind of been on the trying to start a business side of things. Um, and I think some of the insights that you brought to that were, were quite useful, but I want to take a little bit of a different spin on it. Mm -hmm. My question is more around the relationships that can be de be developed between creators 
and startups or creators and corporates. And so let me maybe give you a little bit of thinking this so you can understand the context of the question. Um, so there are many creative people and I think one of the aspects of being creative and I'm not necessarily speaking about aesthetically enabled but rather being able to come up with um, a vast array of ideas and, and approaches to things. A lot of us kind of either have business ideas or ideas for projects that could be that could be something and in our mind they're this amazing thing but one of the things that i think are a trademark of creatives is when it comes to execution we we tend to get a little bit um distracted and so my question around that is what do you think are some of the opportunities for relationships either between startups or between established businesses in terms of how creators and maybe creators is a better word like on how they can engage with each other like what value is there that a creator can maybe bring to a startup and that a startup might be able to bring to the the role of a creator i don't know if you have any thoughts on that yeah i mean what springs to mind immediately is the journey we're going on um a serve craft, you know, uh, one of the first things that mm -hmm. I observed um, when I kind of joined the company is um, a product isn't built with a tech team. You know, if, uh, mm -hmm. if you ask a tech team to build a product, they will build you something and they'll build you a bunch of features. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, a product is built around a user or a customer, um, a person, and around a problem. And I think mm -hmm. you know the, the, the role that creatives add to business is so powerful um, because ultimately they complement um, mm -hmm. they complement the technical and even the commercial to add the human, mm -hmm. right? To add the, the, mm. the personal. Um, and I think that there is such an opportunity for any creative who wants to make a real impact on a, on a big business, on a business by solving a problem because many of the startups I've been exposed to um, just through my time at Founders Factory, you know, they might have been strong technical or they might have been strong commercial, mm -hmm. but almost a consistent gap, consistent gap of kind of capability in that space was was around the the product and the human element. And um, mm -hmm. I think that there's a for any creative that wants to follow a career in which they you know aren't a small cog in a big machine, and not to undermine if you are a small cog in a big machine, because that might be the choices that you've made. But if you want to make a real impact in a startup, there's no team. There's no other creative team. There's no necessarily other you know, people who can tell you what to do. There's no necessarily other people you could even lean on in your discipline to be able to kind of give you ideas. Like the buck can stop with you. Um, and so that's not for everyone because you, know, you might find it intimidating you might have the risk appetite you might not want that pressure but at the same time mm -hmm. the opportunity is in you know a blank page the opportunity is in i want to test this let's test it i want to do this let's do it um and you know for any creative who who is looking for opportunity it all starts with the you know why you want what you want and then what you want. My experience, Alfie, funnily enough, and is that not everyone's up for it. Um, I've yeah. spoken to a lot of people yeah. in the creative space and, you know, I don't know if it's a South African thing and maybe you can shed some light on it and I'm happy to open up to like a conversation, but I've kind of identified mm -hmm. like a different buckets of people and there's no judgment on them, mm -hmm. but like a bucket of people is interested in stability security, mm -hmm. salary, mm -hmm. a bucket of people likes diversity, but doesn't have risk appetite. And so they sit in the consulting mm -hmm. agency space. And there's a bucket of people, mm -hmm. which is a teeny tiny bucket of people 
who are up for it, you know, who want to mm -hmm. change the world and are looking for a partner with whom to change it. And I think mm -hmm. that I'm kind of digressing from your question a bit, but like when I see the difference in, in mindset within the, and I'm generalizing, mm -hmm. so you can challenge me as well. If I see the difference in mindset across the creative spaces in, in let's say like North America or, or Northern Europe and South Africa today, I think that because South Africa hasn't seen and experienced exits like real liquidity events in startups to the extent that mm -hmm. you know, North America yeah. and Europe has, yeah. you know, you know, it, it's not clear to anyone where the upside is down down the road, right? Mm -hmm. When you join mm -hmm. a an Uber, there's an idea that like at some point they'll IPO and you can get your slice and you can you know make it rich. Mm -hmm. But in South Africa, it's like, there's, there's not a track record of that. We're nascent, like across Africa, we're mm -hmm. nascent. Even Flutterwave, who just raised $250 million yeah. at a $3 billion valuation, like they haven't exited yet. No one's getting rich off that today. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's, there's this, this, the people who get on the bus today are going to benefit most, but you know, it's like any adoption curve. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking at the creative you know, pool, mm -hmm. the early adapters are the ones who are up for it today. Everyone else is like mm -hmm. waiting to see what happens. I don't know how you feel as, as a creative community, yeah. and a creative group. Like, what are you th your thoughts on that? I, I actually want to comment on that because I actually strongly agree with you. And I, was, I only learned it, I, I think I learned the lesson very slowly. Because at first I wasn't sure what I was experiencing. You know, I, I, at my first job, one of the things that I found, and I was at an advertising agency at the time, is that like, it almost felt like creative people were creating things because they either look good or are a good execution of their discipline, rather than because they're actually creating an impact either for the business or the customer. And at first I thought it was just kind of like, you know, maybe agencies don't just, just don't understand the business aspect of things. And then I moved to ABSA, right? And then ABSA is like, this is a company that's been selling its product for a long time and has done it like experience. And so maybe the, the creative um, echelon there are a little bit more practical in their implementation. And I have to say, Absa is a huge step forward outside of the, the advertising space because I think, you know, they've got a lot more capability. They can afford to actually have quite an expansive team. And I'm, I'm speaking specifically about creatives. But there was still like a separation between the actual product or offering or like, like the actual business transaction and the creative aspect. And... I, I found it really difficult and eventually I sort of came to a similar conclusion where it's like, you know, as soon as you take responsibility for that, the buck stops with you. Like you can no longer say it's the business that's doing this or it's mm. the it's that person over there that's that's kind of like in the way of actually um, achieving results. Um and so, like, you know, now that I've sort of moved to an organization where there's a little bit more relying on me and there's a little bit more impact that each of my decisions have, I understand why. <laughs> it's a lot of responsibility. Like, as much as you can have more impact, every decision you make has more impact, which means every mistake has more impact. Every, like, difficulty has more weight yeah so i always enjoy um speaking to creatives in big organizations because you know and and obviously i've seen both sides of the coin but there's a real question of like how creative are you really being you know how creative yeah. can you be and it's not to say that you know you're in the wrong place but you know i know from my experience that you you don't know what you don't know you know like only mm -hmm. through exposing yourself to different environments and different opportunities and truly understanding them, not just conceptually understanding them, but like leaning into them. Mm -hmm. Will you be able to truly understand the impact you can make and, and what you can physically do, you know, what's really possible. Um, I, I truly believe that most people wildly underestimate themselves um, and the impact they're mm -hmm. able to make. Yeah. And unfortunately that's often compounded 
by the environment they're in. You know, they make choices to be in an environment that constrains them, and yeah. and they they feel that that is the the boundary. You know, that's that's as far as they can go. But if you change the environment, you know, it's transformative. So, um, yeah. you know, I think uh, something that I've sought to adopt over the years is to always be challenging myself of, you know, why am I doing this and what do I want to learn? Um, and you know, those two things end up taking me different places um, mm. over the years, not to say it's a mm. formula for success, but uh, yeah. certainly not boring. <laughs> exactly. I want to comment on what you were asking us around, you know, our perspective around the um, creative community in South Africa mm. and um, I think well firstly my opinion is quite immature because I haven't been in this industry even a decade but um, I definitely have seen and felt that creatives in this country are still trying to understand and come to realization how much impact they can make as a creator firstly mm -hmm. um, mostly because creativity is still very undervalued And then secondly, how much impact they can make in an organization. Mm -hmm. And I even saw that with, you know, me quitting my first job <laughs> at a big agency and the, the commentary and the negative feedback I received from friends and family around leaving that sense of stability mm -hmm. in order to pursue risk rather than stability, so to say. I do have a question around you were speaking earlier about impact and creatives and the impact they can have in a startup environment. And I think maybe this is a little bit of a, a selfish question, twofold question. Mm. The first, I want to hear from your past experience as someone who's worked in both startups that are busy growing and developing and in big corporations, where, Where have you seen or how have you seen creatives contribute and make the biggest impact? And then secondly, which is the more selfish one, as someone entering a startup um, as one of the first permanent creatives and helping to build out that design capability, how can a creative in a startup make the biggest impact they can? What do they need to do? Good questions. Um, <laughs> hmm. Creatives is such a broad, broad term. So I'm trying to like uh, find specific examples. And, you know, you could also be creative in the definition of creative because you know I'm I'm drawn to mm. extending it to those in big organisations seeking to innovate um, who don't necessarily fit in the the bracket of um, Uh, the creative industries, but I'm going to try and stick to what I think your definition is. I think um, organizations who are able to effectively leverage, you know, creative capabilities need to have a certain amount of maturity and a certain culture uh, associated to them. Um, mm -hmm. And that often, you know, stems from the top. It stems from, the openness of the broader leadership team, whether it's at a business unit or at a group level. Mm -hmm. um, and often, you know, it depends on the strength of the, the chief marketing officer or the chief design officer or even the CTO, depending on where the capability sits. Uh, big organizations are a function of organizational design and politics. So, you know, if the design capability mm -hmm. or the creative capability isn't, in the right place or hasn't got the right mandate and the right support, it's never going to really have an impact that it's intended to, however much money is spent on it, however talented the people are in it. That's sad. Pardon? Mm -hmm. That it's, is it's, sad. Right. In, in, my, in my opinion, my I think, um, you know, I, I, well, ABSA is a common thread for all of us, but, you know, I was at, I was at ABSA at a time when they did make mm -hmm. significant investments into mm -hmm. a design capability, probably back in 2015 mm -hmm. to 2017. And, um, you know, unfortunately it wasn't sitting in a place in the organization that was sustainable. And as much as it made an impact on the overall culture, it, it, it didn't make the impact it was intended to. Um, so that's at a, at a macro level, I suppose. But, uh, 
at a more yeah. micro level, more specifics, I think, um, I think you know, my personal experience was, uh, was, was around the rebranding of, of ABSA and, and all the work that was associated to that. I think, um, I think I, I was involved in, and interacted with a lot of you know, very creative, talented people around bringing that to life. Um, I don't know. I'm struggling with the corporate example. I think, uh, you know, I haven't got a good one if I'm honest with you. And maybe that's jaded me in my opinion, um, mm. around where I've seen that's it really, okay. really thrive. Mm. Um, because I'm trying to delineate between creative industries and, 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 you know, innovation. And, and I don't see today creatives in corporate driving innovation. I see more, you know, of the commercial and business heads driving innovation. And I think the smarter ones are surrounding themselves with creative people um, Mm. and surrounding themselves with the disciplines across, you know, creative industries. Um, I see investments being made at ABSA, you know, the big banks um, and big companies in product designers, um, product managers, UX, yeah. UI, user research, like people are cottoning onto the fact that this is important to fuel sustainable growth. Um, mm-hmm. I question whether they've worked it out yet in terms of how to configure those resources in a way that actually works. Um, I'm not giving you a very clear answer, I'm afraid. Um, in terms of the... The startup question, it's mm-hmm. an expert is just someone in the room who knows 1% more than everyone else. Um, that's, mm-hmm. you know, something that's useful to hold on to because if you're that person, you're the expert. And I think in, in a startup where you haven't got a team of designers or a team of UX researchers or a team of UI, mm-hmm. you know, people, if you're the person then you're the expert and like, I think letting go, trying to let go of imposter syndrome, trying to like realize that everybody doesn't really know what they're doing um, is just kind of mm-hmm. taking their best guess, but also believing in your ability to try, you know, I think that that for me is where the most exceptional creative talents in small companies thrive because mm-hmm we're all so conditioned to think about our roles so narrowly. Um, but in a small organization, you're often Mm -hmm. afforded the opportunity and have to think beyond the constraint of your role. You know, your role profile might say this, but stuff's got to get done holistically. So Mm -hmm. I think, you know, for any creative who wants that true breadth of experience and, and true ownership, um, you're always going to know 1% more than everyone else in the room. So, you know, there's an opportunity mm-hmm. in a small business to, to do that. Um, and yeah. for what it's worth, like at Founders Factory, when we saw the impact of product and the impact of product design um, and service design um, on businesses, it was, it was transformative because it would often have been overlooked mm-hmm. and, you know, no one had thought about it before, but, the yeah the the kind of the tenants of those disciplines are the things on which you know sustainable businesses are grown so you know people are cottoning on and um i think there's no better time to mm-hmm. to be in that space to be honest i think you guys are um especially in south africa you are in the right place at the right time i'm excited i'm excited for you mm-hmm. um so I just want to comment on something quick. So I think there might be a few people who are kind of like scratching their heads a little bit because I think you sort of deviate from our typical guest a little bit. Um, and I thought there's so a too. very specific reason why. <laughs> but there's, there's, there's a, a very specific reason for it. And I think when we first spoke, you and I, I kind of realized, they're important, the, realized the importance of also speaking to people like you. Because 
we all have got a very defined conceptualization of what it means to be creative. And, you know, I touched on this a little bit, you know, we've got this idea that your output has to be beautiful in some other way, or you have to bring like some kind of, you know, off the beaten path sort of output. And I think even as creatives, we sometimes think about that. And I think many times that's one of the places where imposter syndrome actually stems when you can't mm. actually come up with a, a, um, a super creative looking output, but maybe it's because the good solution is the simple one. And so the reason why I wanted to sort of have you speak to us a little bit is because I think it's important to be able for us to learn to actually distinguish between aesthetics and creativity because at, at its fundamentals creativity is a way of thinking and you know when when you've kind of when you kind of took us through your journey um of moving like sort of making the decision to take a leap of faith um when you were in malawi and deciding to actually make africa your home you know we've spoken to a number of creative people and one of the things that has been consistent and steph mentioned this is like this sort of almost just ignoring risk in a sense and reaching for the opportunity. We've had so many people speak about that. And then the other thing that has also been a common thread is this feeling of like inadequacy. And, you know, you spoke a little bit about your time at Founders Factory and the huge shift that you made and having to actually deal, uh, deal with the feelings of sometimes feeling like you're out of your depth. And that's also a common thread that we've kind of seen speaking to it quite many of our guests, if not all. And so it sort of leads me to conclude that there are many people who are not necessarily in typical, typically creative disciplines, but are creative in their way of thinking and are creative in their way of doing things and are creative in the way they approach their lives. They're willing to turn from the light and enter the unknown and kind of forge a new path. And I think it's important for creative people to know that, that just because a person's job title, just because their history is not necessarily a designer, a painter, a photographer, whatever it might mm, be, yeah. it doesn't mean that there isn't something creative in them. And I say that also because I think creative people also need to start realizing that your job title doesn't have to be creative for you to actually be a creative person. You can step out of the typical, the typically creative role and maybe take a role, you know, as a head of partnerships or a, or a, a business leader. You know, obviously you do need to um, learn the, the, the required skills, but, you know, I think there's, there's a hesitance almost feeling like you're selling out of the, the, the creative role that you're, you're in to kind of be on the quote unquote business side, but there's creativity to be had there. And so maybe that leads me to one of the questions which I wanted to ask you that's a little bit more personal. And it's around how, how you find that your creativity expresses itself. You know, we've kind of, we've kind of mentioned the fact that it, it kind of comes out in different ways for different people and it's about a way of thinking. And so I remember Stephanie and I once had this conversation ch uh, when we were chatting with each other. And um, I think I've mentioned it a few times, but I find I'm most creative when I'm speaking to people. Like that, that for me is my, almost like my, my native form of creativity. I don't know if you've got something like that or if you've ever given it any thought. And I'm trying to think uh, while you're talking of, of, of the answer and what, what stands out to me is I think I'm most creative when I'm experiencing things. So for better or worse, I'm often the guy in the room and have been through the whole of my career and life, much to dismay of my wife, that like vocalizes the why, like why are things like this? Mm -hmm. You know, whether I'm in a, a boardroom mm -hmm. in a corporate environment, you know, stand up with my team, with a customer, or, you know, at a, at a, as, a, as a user or a consumer having an experience, like talking to the manager, like always asking why. Mm -hmm. You know, because if it doesn't feel right, then it probably isn't right. And so why is it in the first place? Um, 
And I think uh, that we all, we've all been in rooms, right? We've all been in rooms and hearing people talking and maybe we're in rooms and senior people are talking and experienced people are talking. And you might be sitting there thinking like, what are you talking about? Like, I do, don't, I don't, don't mm -hmm. agree. I don't think that's right. Or my, my, my creative place is in those rooms because like, that's where I'm always thinking about how can we, how can it be better? You know, how can it be different? Mm -hmm. How can, um, why is it like this? And, um, I don't know about you guys, but the point you made around, you know, stretching ourselves beyond our role titles, um, mm -hmm. everyone has a voice. And I think, you know, we all have the opportunity to use it every time we are in a forum of any sort, you know, whether it's with friends, whether it's at a restaurant, whether it's at, um, in a boardroom or a team meeting, I think, mm -hmm. you know, I think creative people specifically should harness their creativity around asking creative questions. You know, like, I think that's what I see as a huge opportunity. So, sorry, I'm digressing from a, from a question that you asked. And for me, it's around experiencing, you know, going to immerse myself in something and then just seeing a better way and then asking questions why it can't be that way. And, and then, um, I also love, mm -hmm. I love, the, I love constructive challenge just for the sake of it. You know, just because there's a good idea on the table doesn't mean it couldn't be better. So this idea of saying, and what about this? And what about this? And what about this? Not mm -hmm. taking away from the quality of the idea or to like crush the person's soul who's proposed the idea, but why shouldn't we kick the tires more to make it an even better, better thing? Mm -hmm. I think, um, mm -hmm. I think that's also, I, I don't, I don't generally like to accept things. I always like to, to keep pushing by asking why, <laughs> um, yeah. questions are powerful. Questions can change mindsets. And I think, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. constantly asking questions is, a, is a powerful tool. I don't know if I answered your question. Just went on a bit of a rant. Definitely. No, definitely. And I think, I think you're right. Um, and you know, I think we are probably heading into the closing stages of the, of the discussion, but I think you're super right. You know, you, 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 as, as I said, you know, creative creativity is a way of thought. And I think it's good because being in, um, a person that's willing to, to challenge the status quo, to challenge the way things already are, is a hallmark aspect of creativity. Yeah, um, definitely. And, you know, I think especially as a person who is leading a group of people in building um, building a new uh, venture and, and starting a new journey um, relative, I guess, to, to other businesses, I think it's extremely important because it's it's, I think, the thing that creates that space that we mentioned earlier that gives creativity the room to breathe having that person who is is willing to ask the the extra why who is willing to create mm. that um that bit of additional space um yeah i think i think yeah. we probably should wrap things up because we have been at it for for a while now and it's been it's been good it's been good i do right. want to echo alfie what you said um around you know, as creatives, we, we do need to start looking towards the non-typical creative people in our organization to start engaging with them more and seeing them as teammates as well that we can leverage in our problem solving uh, process. Because Charles, like you said, you know, you are one of those people who we like to say why. And if we can find those people in the organization, whether they have a creative title or not, there's still a lot we can learn from mm -hmm. those people and they can add value to our journey. We can use those people to our advantage, if I put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just wanted to echo what Alfie said. Great. No, I think um, there's huge power in diverse network. You know, we all have something to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. So um I'd encourage, exactly. encourage all of us to broaden our horizons. We, we, we know so little. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. All right, cool. Charles, thank you so much for making the time to chat with us. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Um, 
and you know i know okay. some of the some of the questions were maybe outside of the typical typical ones but i think you've brought a lot of value to us and kind of opened the door to mm. a world that um some of us might not generally get to see and you know it might it might not necessarily have always felt like it in the conversation but i think a lot of i at least have even picked up a few things that I'll, i will take with me and i really appreciate you making the time um, and be willing to share some of your journey it's a pleasure and um you know for what it's worth i'm always available for a cup of coffee for anyone uh of your listeners who's who's interested in uh, in having one so um amazing charles thank you so much charles thanks pleasure for, um, great talking to you guys and yes yeah definitely gonna take you up on that cup of coffee sounds good and to everybody listening thank you so much for giving us your time and until next time have a good one cheers guys cheers guys